Thank you guys. Yeah, I actually highly recommend everybody pull up these slides right now so we can kind of go through them together because there's a whole lot of um, looking at CESM documentation and websites and you guys will probably want to save off some of these URLs uh, so that you can have them for reference this afternoon as we're working through all of these things. So uh, my name is Kate. I am a software engineer with a Climate and Global Dynamics lab Laboratory at NCAR. Um, this is my first talk in front of people in like three years. <laughs> so like, I'm, I might get giggly. We'll see how it goes. Um, the basic outline for this talk is that I'm gonna go over a whole lot of different web pages and documentation and uh, resources for you guys when it comes to building and using this model because it is a huge model with tons of options. And I would say that it's probably one of the um, most documented versions of this model that we've ever had. So there's a whole lot of um, useful stuff out there that you guys need to know about as you're learning to use it. Um, and then we'll look at how to uh, download and access the code, how to set up a basic case, and how to run your first CESM model simulation, which you guys will all be doing this afternoon. All right, so let's dive right in. I'm going to keep slides up over here so that I can remember what I'm supposed to talk about while I pull up the website for you guys. So we're just going to start with the CESM webpage. Um, so you can see this is cesm.ucar.eu. And this covers, you know, the whole CESM ecosystem and working groups and documentation and CESM models, uh, support for CSM1, CSM2, um, all the future versions. So there's a whole lot that's sort of embedded in this like oh, nicely simple website that scrolls very quickly. Thank you. <laughs> That's fine. Actually, why don't you go back to the slides? There you go. Uh, so I wanted to point out that um, okay, <laughs> uh, that there's um, project information on there. If you if you go back, I wanted to point to the links. There you go. I'll tell you. I'll tell you when to go. <laughs> Thank you for your help. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, let's look at, at some of the stuff. There's history. Um, the working groups is kind of an important part. So most of you guys will have some sort of uh, basic specialty. There's very few people who are about the entire model system. Um, and you will work with some very specific working groups um, for your model. Um, so these are all of the groups that work together to make this model. Uh, there's land, atmosphere, the whole atmosphere, the atmosphere model, the land model, ocean model. So depending on what your specialty is and what your work is, you'll probably be affiliated with one working group or another um, in the development of this model going forward and usage. So this website actually shows you how to get to the website for each of these working groups. And um, once you get there, then you're gonna see more information about the work they're doing, the meetings that are going on, the important things that are happening for them and give you information on um, the development of the model there. I'm gonna go back to main CSM page real quick and um, just talk about, oh, this isn't where I was. Go back this way. Here we go. Uh, the projects really quickly. So over here we have um, a lot of the projects that have already been done with CESM and then give you quick links to get to them. So CMIP data, climate data guide where you can pull those down. And these give you information about how the projects were completed and who worked on them and what all went into them. Um, there's a lot of different projects here. In the slides, I point out the large ensemble, which I know a lot of you guys have used or work with. Um, and then there's uh, more recent ones like the stratospheric aerosol um, injection uh, experiment, other um, more recent com community uh, experiments. Um, so like I said, this page covers CESM and many different um, versions. This talk, we're going to talk mostly about CSM 2.1, which is an older version of the model. Um, it's a good place to start to learn because it is well documented and well used. And if you guys run into issues, probably other people have run into those issues before. So 
that's what you're going to be learning on today, but know that development has been ongoing since this was released. And a lot of times it's best to use the most recent version of the model for your science. So the latest CES and development release you can see here is 2.2. Um, and then the production release 2.1.3 is what we're going to be using in this. All right, let's go back to the slides again. Thank you guys. Okay, so next. Uh, I was going to go through the actual CESM2 um, itself. So this is for the most recent version of the model, uh, CSM2. Here we go. Um, this includes uh, information on how to download it, experiments that have been done to scientifically validate the different configurations, um, and lots of different uh, information about uh, all the differences in the release. Goodness, the scrolling on this is a little tricky for me. Um, so if you look at the release series information, this explains sort of the differences between the two main releases that we have for CSM2. The 2.1 series is what we call our CMIP or our production uh, model. So if you want to run any of the CMIP experiments that were done uh, just a few years ago, um, if you want to rerun those with the same code, then you want to use something in the CSM2.1 um, series. If you want to use the more recent um, CESM releases with scientific updates with CAM6 and uh, some of the new um, coupling infrastructure and things along those lines, um, that is CESM 2.2. Um, the caveat here is that CSM 2.2 is not a scientifically supported version. There's a lot of new science in there. Um, you may not get the same kind of like uh, climate balance out of this newer version, but you can get some, let's show you here all of the updates that have happened. Uh, so if some of these are very uh, important to you, like using the new mom, uh, ocean model or these updates to CLM or updates to WACO Max, then you're gonna need the 2.2 model. All right, okay. Um, on here, I have pointed out the, go back for a minute. Um, down here, so there's the quick start, uh, documentation for seam, and we're going to be looking at this more import, uh, more lately, uh, configuration and grid resolutions, we're going to look into this a little bit more, um, and then the name list and XML information is all on here, and it'll be linked in the slides too. So let's go back to the slides real quick. Thank you. And we'll talk a little bit about CSM too. So you guys probably saw this in the talks this morning. I wasn't around to see exactly what they talked about for architecture, but classic CESM2 coupling is a hub and spoke architecture where we have a coupler as our hub, and then each one of the prognostic components are spokes off of that hub. So you can configure this model to include feedbacks from any of these different prognostic components, depending on which ones you turn on actively and which ones you leave as, say, data models or stub models, which are available. Um, and they all interact uh, back and forth with the MCT uh, driver mediator and CESM 2.1. So you can see that the available prognostic models right now um, for CESM 2 are sea ice, ocean, atmosphere, um, and this includes WACM, even though I don't have this listed here for the whole atmosphere, um, the land model, uh, wave watch, um, the, this is a data assimilation um, component, ESP. Uh, land ice with SISM and a river runoff uh, component with Mozart. So I just wanted to update this a little bit as we're working towards CESM 2.3. The most recent versions of the model that are being tested right now have replaced the MCT driver with a new OPSEEK driver mediator setup, um, which is very similar architecture. You can see the picture is the same, it's just now purple. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it's a different uh, sort of um, software backing uh, based on the ESMF uh, software packages, um, which makes our model more compatible with other models from different modeling sites. Um, so we're, we're sharing this uh, mediator software now with NOAA, and it's creating a bit of a standard in the um, Earth system modeling uh, projects going forward that allows us to, to have more um, prognostic component interactions in our model. So you can see now going forward, we have, um, you know, we're going to lose support for POP or we've got MOM and HICOM. 
we're going to be able to support uh, different and more complex versions of atmospheric models and things like that as we go. So this will be really interesting to see um, where we can take it and uh, how the model evolves going forward. One of the things that I really need to talk about with you guys for uh, CSM is the SEAM um, infrastructure, the coupling infrastructure for modeling Earth. Um, so C-I-M-E, we call it SEAM. Um, and this is the Python-based uh, model infrastructure that we use to do our workflow. So when you are creating a case, when you're building the model, when you're submitting to the PBS run, all of these Python-based scripts that wrap everything up for you um, are part of SEAM. And in the versions of CESM that we're working with here, 2.1 and 2.2, this also includes the data models um, and system unit testing and the mapping utilities that are part of the coupler as well. So this is a large um, software infrastructure that's actually shared between uh, a couple different models as well. So the E3SM model uses a similar um, software architecture for some of its previous versions. Uh, yeah, you can see here um, impasse as well. And the NOAA and EMS model has used it in the past. I'm not sure if they're still using it. Eric can, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, so we're going to run CESM. We've got a couple different parts of the workflow, but this is basically it. Like it's not that hard. It's just you got to get used to the workflow and what we do with this model and the lingo and the language that we're going to use are all um, hopefully outlined here. Um, there's going to be a few one-time setup steps, so you need to download the CESM code typically. In the tutorial, we're going to actually use some code that we stored off on Cheyenne for you because we made a few little tweaks to help you guys run when we've got like 100 people all running the model at once, uh, sometimes at Bog Cheyenne down, so we've, we've made some tweaks to help speed that up for you guys. Um, in the future, you're, you're going to need to download this from GitHub, and so I've got instructions on how to do that in these slides. Um, and then if you are using a computer other than Cheyenne, you're going to need to get all of the input data that you need to run the model. So all of the um, boundary condition data, enforcing data that you're interested in using for your run. And that can be handled automatically depending on your configuration and what um, computer you're on. Typically it's a massive amount of data. Um, so hopefully you guys are gonna be generally running on uh, computers that have already had CES imported and most of this data uh, downloaded and set up for you guys. Um, if not, you may have to work with your systems administrators to get all of that going before you do this. Um, that process of running the model on a machine that's never been run on before and isn't supported yet is called porting the model to that machine. And uh, we actually do sort of talk about that a bit during the week. I think it might be on Wednesday or Thursday this week, somebody's gonna go into a detailed instruction on how to port the model to new um, computers. And we actually even have the ability to run, you know, like single column versions or very simplified versions of CESM, um, you know, just the atmosphere or just the, uh, the glacier model on your laptop. So you could port CESM to a MacBook um, and it could work. So you can learn about how to do that on Thursday. Um, when it comes to actually creating and running an experimental case, um, there's just a few steps. We're going to uh, create the case um, in SEAM, and so that tells the model the configuration that you want to use for your case, and it creates um, the directories around that. And then when we invoke case.setup, that builds the infrastructure within the case directory for you to configure the case further. Um, and then we're going to build the executable with case.build. Um, run the model with case.submit on the batch nodes, and then review the output data. So I just started talking about some of these places. This is where we get into the jargon. There's four main paths that you have to remember when you're doing your workflow with CESM. Okay, so I kind of have these like color-coded areas. The paths are directions to different locations on the computer where you keep sets of files. Um, and we save those paths as what are called roots and all the, all the configuration files of CESM and the XML configuration files. So the source code is stored as source root and seam root is a subdirectory of your source root. Uh, so whenever somebody says, oh, you need to go look in your source code to see what's in there, that is the sort of blue location. It's important to know where you put your source code. 
so you can go back to it later. When you create your case, that goes into another directory in a different location, and that's we call the case um, path or saved as case root. Um, when you build and run the model, you get two directories on uh, this a drive and Cheyenne, it goes into your scratch space. So it's machine dependent, but it builds directories in a place where you're going to have the space to build and run um, and gather large files. And then finally, once the model is complete, um, many times you run uh, this archive data. So by default, the short-term archiver runs after the model is done, and that will copy all of the data and log files, zip them up for you, and put them into this uh, fourth archive data location, uh, which is saved in your case directory is dout s root. So you're going to be looking for this a lot um, as we talk about it, because that's where everything goes when it's finished successfully. OK, so downloading CESM. As I said earlier, uh, for you guys, we actually go and use um, some code that we've already saved off to Cheyenne for you. But CSM is a public um, project, and you can go and download this code from GitHub. You don't require any um, login or credentials to do it. You can just go right onto that website. Uh, the information on how to download it is here. So um, you can see this little line. I don't know if I can hide. I can't highlight it. <laughs> uh, but it's a Git clone. Um, dash B means that we're creating a branch, and we're naming it um, release CSM 0.2.1. Um, this is the URL uh, where CSM comes from, and um, we're going to put it into this directory named CSM 2.1.1. So this is the GitHub branch, our tag name, and then this is the actual path location on your computer. So when you do this command, you should see uh, these sort of Git uh, commands come out of it, where it's cloning it in. It It'll give you a warning that you're in the attached head state because you're looking at a tag, and that's fine. If you want to make changes to your source code, you'll have to create a working branch for that, um, which is what this instruction here says. This is totally normal and expected. So once you're done with that, you would uh, change directories to go in there, and then you could take a look at the code that gets checked out. So because CESM has this hub and spoke architecture, the code that you get when you check out from GitHub is actually relatively small. It's really just a file or a couple files like uh, externals.config and um, scene config that help the model point to all the different source code that it's going to pull in uh, later. So this is what the directory listing looks like. You get a change log that explains the um, changes that have happened up until this tag, uh, some copyright and license and readme information. Um, some configuring for Seam, this externals file, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, and manage externals, which is the utilities for bringing in all of the other source code that you actually need to run the model. So the first thing you would do at that point, um, this is just to orient us, we're going to take a look. So we are in our source route right now. This is where we just cloned our uh, code into from GitHub. And you do a manage externals, check out externals. And this goes along and it pulls in the code from all of the different components and external repositories to build a whole CESM. And you can see that it goes through this configure file and then the configure files, oh goodness, it's blue, there you go, um, for all of the subcomponents as well, pulling in any external files that they have. Um, so this gets you your uh, land model, your river runoff, your wave watch, gives you the seam infrastructure, which is also an external uh, to CESM, um, sea ice, uh, pop, SISM glaciers, uh, RTM, and the atmosphere cam. All of these things get pulled in by managed externals. So this piece of software is a really powerful piece of software that can help manage all of these external um, utilities for you. And based on what's in your um, externals.cfg file, uh, all of these externals should be the correct versions to work together. Uh, so it, it manages all the versioning and pulls in everything from all the repositories. And again, you didn't need any credentials to get those uh, source code um, things from the directories. Um, so once you've done that, you're going to see a few more pieces um, of code in your, so now we're back to our, our checkout directory here. Actually, 
plans node. So now I've switched paths to the pre-downloaded tutorial version of the model. Um, so Glade PCESM tutorial, when you guys log on to Cheyenne, this is where you can go to see the source code that we've already checked out for you. You're going to need to go there uh, to create your case. So once you go to that uh, directory, you can see that this is your you know, house number one source code. And then here, right underneath the main directory is the seam subdirectory. So that is your seam root. Um, and then the component subdirectory is where all of those prognostic components were checked out into. So these are two new subdirectories that came from running manage externals. Um, if we go into components, you can see the source for each of these prognostic components has been checked out into that directory. Um, so this one just sort of shows you what each one is. And if you went into, say, the CAM directory, um, you can see all of the CAM source code in here, um, included to SVN external directories in this version of CESM. Uh, CAM has been moved to Git since then. I'm not sure what's on um, Glade right now. Uh, and then if you went into CLM, you could go see that it has all of its source code in that subdirectory as well. So. So Seam has, uh, like people have said already, um, all of these scripts that wrap up all of these complicated things that you want to do with the model, including all of the modules and uh, code libraries that are required to build and run the model on a supported machine like Cheyenne. So if you, um, if you use these scripts on Cheyenne, then you don't have to worry about the module load or the module spider or module variables. You don't have to worry about uh, which compiler if you don't want to. Um, it's all pre-configured for you already in the model. So if you go into the Steam directory, you can take a look at the files that are in there. Um, and it, it doesn't look like a lot, but the scripts directory is where we're going to be spending a lot of time. Um, Seam uses a library of XML files to define all of the different configurations that you want to use in this model. Um, so if you guys haven't worked with XML before, it's usually pretty straightforward. Like it, it's pretty quick to pick up. Um, you're going to see a lot of things like this in these files where there's an entry ID with a name and then the value. So I've been talking about the different roots. Here is your seam root, and it's going to be inside um, an XML val a file in your case directory. So it has the ID seam root, and then the value here is the path to that. Um, and then it gives you a type. So this, this is a character type that's expecting letters and a description that says the full path name of the seam source root directory. So there are hundreds of these XML variables that are used to configure all of the different uh, prognostic components and all of the different parts of the model. And we have um, scripts set up to read and make sure that your XML is valid and to record all of the XML changes that you make so that you can redo any of your experiments later. So you need to keep track of all the changes and work that you do as you build an experiment so you can know what you did and reproduce it later. Reproducibility is a huge part of science and you don't wanna just get some result and you don't know what you did along the way. So we have a, a lot of support built into that. And one of the important parts of that is the XML um, file system. So the scene documentation, I am gonna go ahead and click on this real quick guys, um, is here. And this goes into case control system, uh, basic usage, more complex usage. It goes into all the scripts that can be used for all the different testing um, and case modification uh, sources and just about anything you could possibly need to know is, is here. Um, so it is a, a pretty complex piece of software um, that will do a whole lot of stuff for you. It's very powerful. It's not a bad idea to take a look at this as you're um, learning how to use the model. All right, we can go back to this. Thank you. Okay, um, and yeah, so don't be afraid to explore these directories. Um, the query config script and the create new case script are gonna be ones that we use in the, um, the practical this afternoon. Uh, feel free to, to poke around and try, try things and look at the help pages and you know just see what's on there and available and what might be useful to you guys. Okay, so this is our super quick start and this is basically what you guys are gonna be doing this afternoon. CESM2 can be run with basically four commands. So you've got a one-time step where we're going to create a directory to store all of our experiments or the case directories, which is the uh, second little house that you have to remember where your case directories are. 
Um, and then you would go into scripts or into your subdirectory of seam. So this is your seam root inside of your source directory and the script subdirectory that I pointed out earlier. And we're gonna run the script called create new case. Um, so that creates a new case uh, in the directory where you're going to put your cases. So you give it the path and the name here, and then the resolution and the comp set. And I'll go into that in more detail in just a minute. Um, and then just to go over this quickly, we're gonna go into each of these in pretty good detail. Um, so, you know, bear with me, but we also, we go into that case, we set up the case, we build the case and we submit the case. So those are the four main parts of this um, setup workflow. So creating a new case experiment. The case control system is a huge part of CESM to configure all the different options for this model. So if you're an ocean person, you're gonna be using all of the ocean configuration. If you're an atmosphere person, you might not even use an ocean. So, you know, there's a huge variety of setup and experiment options that are all managed by the case control um, system here. So when you go into the seam scripts directory and you call create new case, you need three main arguments, the case name, the resolution, and which uh, configuration of components, which we call a comp set. Um, and then you can give it the argument for what machine you're running on. Um, if it's a fully supported machine like Cheyenne, you don't actually have to do that. We can tell when it runs. <laughs> um, but if you're running on a local machine, you may need to uh, spe specify the name of that machine so that it can look it up the information on which modules and build libraries and all those things it needs to do. Um, just to note that for these scripts, you can always run the script name with a, so like create new case, you can run it with dash dash H or dash dash help. And it'll give you a whole lot of documentation right there in your terminal um, that will tell you about how to use it, the arguments, all the options, things along those lines. All right. So these arguments, uh, when you create a new case, um, you give it a name here and Oh yeah, so dash dash case specifies the name and then the location of your case directory, which is said already. Um, we have some shorter case names for our experiments here. Like this just says B dot day one. Um, when you get into running experiments, you're probably gonna make these uh, case names very long and complex. So you can sort of encapsulate everything that's going on uh, inside each case and just the name as you're looking through your subdirectory. Um, so we actually have documentation on the naming conventions that we use in our experiments with CESM online. Um, and so it gives you an idea here of um, the case names that we've used for different experiments. Typically the first letter has to do with uh, the comp set that you've used. Um, and then the second letter is the version of the model. So E21 is um, CESM 2.1. Um, E220 would be CESM 2.0, which is a uh, model that's used very often. Um, the third thing here is the comp set that you use to, to create it. And I'll explain comp sets in just a minute. There's the resolution. And then this would be sort of a experiment name or description. And then usually it's a good idea to have a string of numbers afterwards because you're probably not going to only do one. <laughs> um, you know, you do your first one, you set it up, you give it a try, and then you have a dot dot two where you fix all of those small issues, or a dot dot three where you get that final file from that guy who you've been waiting for. Um, you know, there's always another version that's going to happen. Um, so this explains all of that, and you can read it at your leisure. Can you go back to my slides? Thank you. All right, uh, the resolution. So this is an important um, consideration when it comes to the model because there's so many different configurations and each component requires a different grid configuration. Um, and there are even grids that are available but not particularly well supported. You need to be able to use a grid configuration that will work for all of the components that you've decided to use. So if you have say a fully active model, you need grids that are supported um, the fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean and the land and the sea ice and all of the active uh, components. We specify our grids with these really short aliases is what they're called. So F19, G17, you'll get used to seeing this. This is a uh, 1.9 or two degree finite volume core atmosphere. And G17 is a uh, similar ocean uh, supported um, ocean. Uh, core and until I'm an atmosphere model, not a ocean person. So this alias um, 
is short name for this right here, which is the long grid name. And it specifies the atmosphere. So your little letter in front of the percent and then the actual atmospheric grid. Um, the atmosphere and the land are almost always run on the same grids and the ocean um, and sea ice use the same grid configuration here, OI. Uh, the river and the land ice and the wave and the typically use their own grids. And then there's an ocean ice mask um, that is specified there. So when you create your case, you can just say this nice little like seven letter alias. And what the model knows you want is this whole confusing string and it'll set that up for you. If you ever wanna do something outside the bounds of what we have alias for you, you can specify that whole long name for a grid um, and see what happens. Uh, we have documentation on which grids are supported. So you can go to this uh, website, which is the output from that config uh, query grids command that was on the previous website. And it'll show you um, our grid naming conventions oof, and then the basic uh, grids that are available. And you can search through these which as well, which is super helpful. And it gives you information about each one. So like this one by one Camden, New Jersey is a small scale grid that's um, only useful with the uh, CLM. So it's a single point CLM grid. Uh, and you can sort of expand these here and it gives you an, an explanation for why you would want to use that. If you're looking for something for a specific model, I think you can just say like pop here and it'll show you <laughs> all of the comp sets that are not pop, <laughs> but uh, you can see the grids that are available um, for that configuration. So this is a super useful table if you're looking, browsing through the different grids or you see a grid that comes up and you've never seen it before and you're interested in learning more about it. Um, there's tons of information about all of the grids here. All right, let's go back to the slides. Thank you. And like I said before, uh, there's this query config script in the scripts directory. And this query config script is a very powerful script that can give you all sorts of information about the model in the version that you have checked out. So if you go to your source code in the seam directory and you run query config, you can start with dash dash help and it'll show you all the options there. And then you can do dash dash grids and it'll show you all the grids or you can do dash dash comp sets and it'll do all the comp sets. And it'll basically give you the output from that website. So, you know, depending on where you are and what you want to use, there's different options for that. All right, the last uh, argument here that I want to go into a little more detail is this comp set. So you've heard me use this word a few times. This comp set is our short term, short name for the component set. These are which components are active and prognostic in your model, which ones are data or stub, and that specifies which feedbacks are available and which information goes through the, um, the hub or the flux mediator um, of the model. So we have short names for some really complicated uh, long model uh, options here. This B1850, anything with the B is all active. So every single component is active. And that's what we're gonna be using for our cases because it's what a lot of people use for this model. If you're working on a specific component, you're gonna get used to seeing comp sets that have a specific letter in front of them. So like atmosphere, you typically see F in front of it. Um, because those are the main atmosphere comp sets uh, without running without an ocean. If you're used to seeing, you work with land ice, which I also work with, then you see a lot of T comp sets go through. Um, so there's um, a website with that, and I think I have a link for that in a minute. This short alias uh, is short for this long name here. So when you create a case, you can actually go into your README case file and see what long name comp set was created. In this case, the B1850 um, alias gives you an 1850 time run uh, with CAM6, CLM5 uh, with the BGC options, sea ice is active, POP2 is active with the eco settings, Mozart is active as your river, SISM2 in this case is active but not evolving, Wave Watch 3 is active, and then you have a BGC scenario specified. So. There's a huge amount of information here. And depending on which feedbacks you want, this is gonna look differently. So it's a good idea to get comfortable with this as you're going forward, but it's not necessary for you to memorize all of this for today. So here is the website with those con uh, comp sets. And again, this is, you can run query config dash dash comp sets to get this information at your terminal if you want to. 
uh, but this is a really um, useful page. And you can see um, all of these concepts uh, are here. There's funds and then goes on 208 entries. So there's a lot of different model concepts. Not all of these are, just one sec, um, not all of these are scientifically supported. Um, a lot of, not a lot, some of them are more experimental than others. Some are very well validated and tested and are going to work all the time. And that's what we're gonna use today. Some might be a little riskier to use um, depending on which version of the model you have. Okay, uh, I, did, I saw that hand go up real quick. I mean, I think it's easy. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. Could you go back to that slide? So here you go. This long name, um, you start to get used to what each of these little um, things mean, but it will look different. So if you had, say, a data atmosphere, instead of saying CAM60 here, it would say DATM. So that stands for the data atmosphere. If instead of having SISM and a no-evolve situation here, it would say SGLC, so we're stub glacier. Um, you could have a stub ice, S ice, instead of C ice. Um, so yeah, it, once you learn the acronyms, um, it will be right there in the long name, what your configuration is. But you know, if it's the first time you've ever looked at this gibberish on the screen, it might not be perfectly obvious right at this minute. All right, any other questions? Ooh. Okay, so once we run create new case, that was a lot of detail for that one command. Um, then it's gonna give you a lot of output that looks like this. Uh, you'll see this in your terminal screen and it does give you information a little more broken out. You can tell, see the components right here. It gives you sort of the full name of what you've gotten in this case. Um, it gives you some information on the defaults for the different uh, XML variables that we'll get into more. You get the grid, the, sh the machine, your um, PE settings, so which nodes that you have allocated. And this is all the default um, for a machine that's been ported and supported. Um, it gives you the ComSet long name here and then any machine specific information, including your project number for Cheyenne um, and uh, your PBS queues and things along those lines are all there. If it says creating case directory with the case name that you wanted right down here at the end, then you win. You have a case root. So that's, that's success. So we would go next into that case directory. Um, when you get that case directory right off the bat, it looks like this. It's a bunch of different scripts that will do um, things for you. And then you have these XML files that describe all the different configuration settings for the whole model. And you can see that there's different um, files for different sort of parts of the model usage. So like ENV case will set up different things within your case directory where ENV build will set up the different build options for the different models. Um, so maybe if you wanna set something to be like debug uh, and you wanna get more output, that would be in the ENV build file. You don't really have to worry about where various XML files or variables are if you use the XML change and XML query tools. These are incredibly powerful scripts right here that we will be using for all of our XML changes on the model. So you don't really have to worry about where each one is, but you will get information as you change them about what you need to do in response to those changes. So if you say change the number of nodes you wanna use for this run, um, then you're going to probably need to rebuild the model and you'll get feedback from that if you change it using XML change, which you'll see this afternoon. So this slide gives you a little bit more information about um, which specific variables you could find in each file. So if you're looking for something, you don't exactly know what it is, it might give you an idea of what to look for. However, really the big trick here is to use XML query P. XML query P means you can put a partial va value for any name in, and it'll give you a list of all of the XML variables that match that partial. So say you want to change the time that the model has allocated for this next run, your wall clock time that you've chosen. Like my last run, it was just a test run. I only needed 20 minutes, but now I'm going to do the full production for a year and I need at least 10 hours for that run. What was the XML variable for that? You can just give it a dash P time 
or clock and it'll come up with all those options until you find the one. Oh, job clock time. Yes, that's the one that I need to change. And you set it with XML change. Um, this uses, sorry, uh, stop underscore in as an example, uh, which is a good one. So you would say XML change stop underscore in equals 20. And this would change the uh, length of time that the model is going to run for to 20 of whatever's. The stop option tells you what the whatever is, and we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> All right, uh, this is a slide to talk about XML change because this is another really powerful script. So whenever you make changes to the configuration in your case directory, using XML change is extremely important because it actually records each one of those changes. And so you can tell, you can go back and look in your case.status file and see, oh, this is what I did. Um, so if you wanna go, did I actually set it to continue run? You can either check the, the variable is continue run true, or you can go look in your case status and it'll be listed right there. Oh, I did set it to true. If somebody is looking at your experiment output and they're like, you know, what did you do for the solar forcing? You can go back and look at your case file and say, oh, I set that XML variable to this and it's in your case status file. Um, so you can edit the files directly, the XML files directly, but you really shouldn't. You should use this XML change variable because it'll keep a record of everything you do there. Um, this is an important website that has all of those XML and nameless options for each of the prognostic mo models available. This is a big one that you probably want to uh, bookmark and come back to. Um, so we'll get into the nameless in just a second, but so the case root variable definitions, the XML variable definitions are all here. And, you know, if you want to see like, you know, I saw this get changed. Um, where do I set my user mods directories? Oh, here's the user mods. Uh, it's just a lot of information here for any configurations or changes that you might want to make. Um, so this is this is a really important website. You guys can go back. Thank you. Okay, so we have created our case. <laughs> now we're going to go into that case directory, cd into your cases, b day one, and then the next step is to invoke case.setup. So this goes from that skeleton listing of scripts and XML files into something that's more usable. It checks all of the different comp set and grid configurations and starts to pull in all of the supported files that are needed for that configuration. It's an actually pretty short step. You just say case.setup and you get some output that looks sort of like this. Um, it sets, it creates the case.run file for you, your short-term archiver. It creates the user nameless files for the different components. So that's where you would set your specific uh, nameless settings if it's not an XML variable. Um, it creates the render and exe root directory. So this is our third little house place that we need to remember where the exe gets built to. On Cheyenne, this is in your scratch directory. So you probably have your source code and your cases and maybe Glade work. And then you would have your um, either build an exe directories in scratch because this is where your output files are all going to be as well. You need kind of a, a big space available for the model to just spew all of its stuff. <laughs> um, it creates some hidden files for you as well um, that could be useful in the long run, uh, but I'm not gonna go into too much details here. And then the case docs directory is created, which contains all of the um, final configurations as well. And that gets updated as you make changes too. So it's a good place to look for reference, but you shouldn't edit any of those files directly. They're created and maintained by the case.setup script. Um, I'm going to sort of skip over this. This was sort of the same website as I just showed you a minute ago. The XML variables are on here, but the nameless variables are on there as well. And if you've worked with any of these specific components before, you know that they love nameless. Nameless are a little bit of a holdover from previous, you know, to seem eras, but they're still very useful for defining values that are uh, runtime values. So if you want to specify a different different um, set of history outputs to the atmosphere model, you're going to do that in the CAM name list. Um, if you want to set different frequencies for output files for your ocean, then you're going to do that in the POP name list. So those files that were created, the user NL files, it's user name list and then the component name, and that's where you would put those new name list options in there. Um, there is a script in your case directory called preview name list, and if you run that, it will try to 
make all those name lists work and it'll tell you if there's any options or settings that don't make sense that you did wrong or files that don't exist um, things along those lines so this is a, a very useful script as well um, this will get called when you build but if you aren't quite ready to build yet you just want to see what i did so far the preview name list script is a quicker way to check that so as I mentioned, the case setup creates your exe root and your render, um, and we've been working in your case root here. So you can do XML query and see the path to where these new um, directories were created. But typically, if you're on Cheyenne, it's just going to be in your scratch directory. There's going to be a new um, directory with the same name as your case directory there, and then a build and a run subdirectory. The run subdirectory is going to be where you put um, any sort of restart files or boundary condition files that the model might need uh, for your particular run. And then your history and log files are going to be in there as well. So as you're working, you might want to go back there to look for your log files if you hit an error. OK, so we did the setup. Now we're going to build. Um, when you build the model, it's just as easy as calling q command dash dash case dot build on Cheyenne. Uh, as Rory mentioned earlier, you don't want to do giant memory intensive runs on the login nodes. Sizzle gets upset at you and then they shut you down and send you home. So the uh, when we build CESM, it is a big build. And I would say 99% of the time I would get shut down if I just tried to do that from the login node. So it is a good idea on Cheyenne to always use Q command for your case.build script. And that will submit it to one of the batch nodes and uh, everything should go much more smoothly for you there. So we'll be practicing that this afternoon. Um, if you make any changes uh, that your build is no longer valid for, so like if you change the number of PEs that you needed or a different, you know, biogeochemistry library or a different land model setup that would require a rebuild, um, then you can use clean all or just dash dash clean. Clean all cleans all of the external libraries, including the MCT support, the IO support, and things along those lines. It's a very, very full clean. Um, if you just do dash dash clean, it will clean all of the main component libraries. So that's a faster build afterwards. Um, the case that build script also checks all the nameless files and the XML files for running. So it runs that preview nameless script that I was just talking about. Um, and it will give you an, an error if you have any um, configurations that are not quite right uh, for this model. So that'll give you a, a first check for um, everything that you have configured up to this point, including if any input data is missing. So, excuse me, if you are not running on Cheyenne, um, this is gonna be where you sort of rubber hit the road the first minute to see if you have all of the boundary condition enforcing files that you need for this experiment. Um, and input data is pretty good about actually going out and looking for that data and trying to download it if it isn't locally. So that can be super helpful, uh, but also pretty slow. So just uh, realize that when it happens. Um, and it's not always 100% successful. So we see a lot of issues with people uh, when they hit this on their uh, computer. Okay, so case of build gives you a lot of output to your terminal. You can see all of this here. Um, and it sets up all the directories. You can see where it creates the name list that'll be used in the actual run. Um, it will say building each library with output two, so you can watch it as it goes. Um, each one of these little lines can take quite a while. Oh, here it says how many seconds. This must have been a pretty fast build. Uh, SISM usually takes a little longer. Uh, yeah, and then a total time spent building and if you see model build has finished successfully at the end you win and then it's time to submit your case so that's pretty straightforward but for us today we're going to have to keep track and make sure that we have the correct project codes and queues um, so the project code is a project that you are going to charge your computer usage time to you guys are all here in our tutorial so you get to use our project code and our computer time and today that project code is UESM0011. So when you set up your case before you submit, you need to make sure that you set your project via XML change to this um, number. And then you should check to see what queue is in your run. Using our instructions, you probably won't have to change your queue each day, but it's always a good idea to check to see where you are so that you don't 
accidentally say charge one and a half times as much as you want to for your model, or you don't say overload the system because you're not using the tutorial queue today. So if you do XML query, and again, here's my favorite dash P, just put it in Q, and it'll give you all of the different Q options and their settings right now. So the job Q for this particular case is set to regular. Um, you're gonna hope that it looks more like um, what the tutorial Q is for the day. So once you've uh, done that, you can set little extra options like your um, uh, stop in, like I said, is the number of things that you're running and stop option is what you're running. So this particular model, is gonna go for five days. End days is that you're running it for days. Uh, your options for stop option are actually in that XML variable. So if you go back to that website and look for stop underscore option, um, you'll see all the different possibilities for that. Uh, but your you know steps, days, years, months, you can specify your model run length in any one of those. Um, so then we are going to run case.submit, which is right here. This is kind of tiny, even for me to look at right in front of my face. So I hope that you guys can see the gist of it. Um, it's going to recheck your name list for you. It's going to recheck your input data for you. It's going to submit your case.run, which is your batch script that Rory was talking about for you, that it built for you already. Um, and then it submits another job, which is the short-term archive job that happens after your model runs successfully, where it copies all of your data and logs over to your archive directory. And if you run, um, so it's submitting, submitting, submitting the jobs, um, and then it'll give you back to your prompt here. So that means that it was pretty successful. And you can see here, we ran QStat, which Actually, what you're probably going to say is qstat dash u with your username. This was an old slide. Um, and that will show you all of your jobs that you have just created on the machine and what their current status is. So it should give you your name, um, how long they've been doing what they are. This S column is important. That's the status. And then this shows you which queue they went into. So you can see we have our run and our ST archive um, jobs that have been submitted here. Uh, the run job is queue. It's sitting in the queue and waiting. Um, so you probably have a, a minute or two, a couple of minutes of waiting um, because we have a specified queue. You shouldn't have to wait too long for your jobs to run today. Uh, H means hold. So it's waiting on this first job to run. So that's normal. Um, it's going to sit there until this job is done and then this one will run. And then once these are both done, if you do a queue stat, it, will be empty under here. And so that's when you know things are finished. Once you're finished with your run, it, you know, there's some things that you can go back and look at in your case stat or directory. Actually, you could do this while it's running. The case status file I talked about previously shows everything that you've done to this run as you've done it, as long as you use the XML um, change uh, script, XML change um, commands. So this particular example doesn't have any XML changes in it, but you can see that we did case.setup, case.build, we cleaned our build for whatever reason, and then re ran those steps. Um, and then here we have our case.build success, uh, we submitted, and then here it says submit success. So when you see this in your case status file, that means that you've had a successful run. If there's an error with the run, um, a lot of times it'll give you some information in this file about where to go to look for the log with the error in it. Um, so you can start to try to debug what the heck just happened. Um, so yeah, we did it. We're done. We're successful. Uh, it's going to move all of your data into that short-term archive option and then uh, directory. And then eventually you're going to want to look at those. I think on Wednesday, we're going to have a whole day about post-processing and how to run the post-processing scripts. Um, those create nice plots like these for you to see. And if you want to see experiments that have been done and output for those, this is the link for that. I'm not going to follow that, but you guys have these slides so you can go take a look at everything that um, we have posted online and look at all of the results for those experiments. Um, so this is the PI control uh, for CSM 2.1 for the CMIP experiment, looking at years 970 to 995. So you're approaching a thousand years, and this has the um, annual top of the atmosphere albedo uh, against observations here, and this is the difference. 
So this is just sort of a preview of the uh, post-processing abilities. I wanna talk a little bit about create clone, mostly because one of the things that people try to do occasionally is to just copy their case directory. Like, oh, I've got this experiment that I like so far, but I just wanna change this one you know, output variable or something. Um, and they'll just CP the case directory over and that does not work because now all of your pads, all of those little houses are pointing to the wrong spots. So we have the script that'll actually do that for you called create clone. And this does an appropriate job of copying a case directory to another one. So, you know, say you want to update your land surface force thing between different interglacial runs. Um, you would use a create clone to use the same, it creates the same case directory with a new name for you. And then you can go into that new one and make all the changes that you want in there. And it will show you where that, script was or that file was copied from so you can have provenance of where the previous cases um, were and see the development of your experiments as you go if you want to do that um, but again this isn't something we're going to do this afternoon and this is just another note that you should not use cp-r to copy cases just don't do that porting um, i mentioned previously that if you want to run CESM2 on a new machine, it's a process. It is doable. And in fact, you could even do this on your laptops. There's documentation for how to do that here um, and on the CESM2 website. Uh, and there's going to be a whole day where they sort of talk about this process later if you're interested in that more. Um, when it comes to getting help, a good place to start is, you know, each particular component that you're giving trouble to. If you go and look in the working group or the website for those components, you can get more information about them and they might be able to explain what's happening uh, right away. Um, but another good spot for it is the bulletin board. Um, so this is, yeah, it still pretty much looks like this. this is a little bit of an older slide. Um, you can go to the forums, you create a account name and you can search and see if other people have had this problem before. Uh, CSM software engineers and scientists are actually really good about responding to things typically. Sometimes if it's a really difficult or esoteric problem, it might get tossed around a little bit, but you can see what other people have done to try to address these problems. If you're hitting into one, see how common it is um, or ask a new question if you don't see anything like what you wanted. Um, and then you can also go to the tutorial site. So all of these slides and all this information and all of our presentations will be saved for you. So you guys can go and check those out later and be like, what was she talking about with the comm sets and that website? And then it's, it's all there for you on this. So done I'm a little bit late, but we can get started and dive in at the end of the slide presentation that you guys I'm sure have all been following along with on there. Um, it will give you some notes first and then our day one exercises zero on it there. Um, so this is going to be how to log in. Um, and most people, I think when they log in Shine, I know I always get a, a TCSHRC um, shell. Is that sort of the default, Rory? I think he's calling me old. Um, so yeah, okay, you'll get a bash. <laughs> and, um, you will need to copy this profile um, from this location, Blade PC ESM tutorial profile into your um, space. And this will set the environmental variables for using the correct queues and job numbers for this run. So this is, this is an important pre-step, please don't skip this. Um, and then you will wanna source it or log out and log back in to make sure that those are active. Um, and then here we go. We're going to make our case directory. We're going to go into the scene scripts directory, create new case, just like I said. Uh, then we're gonna go check out that case. We're going to run case.setup. We're gonna find our exe root, our render. We're going to check our queue and project to make sure that they are what we expect. And then we're going to build our model here um, and submit it. Take a look at it. This is a QStat dash U log login name, which is the appropriate way to look at QStat now. Uh, check case status to see if it, things are successful when they finish. Find the short term archive location um, and then go look at the data when it's done. So that's the, the main first exercise. And if you can get through that today, then I think you guys can call it a win. 
There's some other options for poking around with cases and scripts and directories and some questions in the exercises 2.3. Uh, so you guys can take a look at those. And then some questions to answer on your own at the end. No, there's no quiz. I don't know who made this slide, but it's fine. <laughs> it's just like, you know, look at this and um, consider these questions. Maybe ask somebody if you don't know the answer or poke around in all the websites and the scripts and the directory and see what you guys can come up with. So can everybody find these slides? All right, I see a lot of heads nodding. That's good. All right. Oh, we got, we, I'm going to come help you in just a sec. Um, and then, yeah, there's some other stuff down here at the end if you want to keep going. So that's what I've got. Do you guys have any questions that you want to ask me while I'm standing up here? Because I'll also be around. I see Eric is here to help. Rory's still around. Yeah. OK, um, so QSub requires a batch script to do your submission. So Rory was showing the scripts with all the hashtag you know, uh, dash L PBS commands at the top. Um, Q command, you can literally do anything with. Like you can send it any sort of thing at the end of that, and the, the computer will just run it. Um, so we use Q command for case.build because the case.build script is not actually a PBS submit script. It's just building the model. Um, does that answer that question, or do you want me to talk more? Okay. Yeah, yeah, building this model, it actually can parallelize the build. So because you're building different um, components, you know, like the atmosphere doesn't require accessing the same source code as the, mo the land model does. So it can build those on separate processors. Um, and it requires a fair amount of memory to build all those object files. Some of them are quite large. Um, so it is much better to do that in a batch system than from the login node. You can type case.build at the login node and see what happens. Um, you never know. <laughs> it might work. <laughs> but yeah, the Q command is what we always do because, like I said, most of the time, if you just type case.build, at your login directory, it'll knock you right off the computer. If you use Q command, it'll put it into the batch and it'll work. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So in these slides, I didn't add the dash A project number that Rory was talking about because it does look for a default project number and typically your build is such a low cost that you can just charge it to whoever and nobody will complain. Um, if you don't have a default project set up yet, which might be the case for you guys today, then you may need to do Q command A with the tutorial project number so that it knows who to charge. Um, so yeah, we'll see if you guys hit that because I should have put that in the slides. I didn't think of it. All right, any other questions? Uh, I'm gonna go with this guy then you, Eric. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. And you could also like take a look at those environment variables that are in the um the profile, and stick them at the end of your um profile file. So that might be another way to go about it. Um, I was going to put in instructions on how to just do it with the XML commands and uh, Jim Edwards, the senior uh, software engineer, really didn't like that. So, you know, I'll just let you know, Jim Edwards prefers everybody use the profile. <laughs> okay, it's up there. Oh. Okay. I don't don't use bash, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Is that right? It's, it's been in the slides for a long time, but I you know we'll see if if people have trouble with these steps, um, let us know and we'll we'll help you guys out. Okay, anything else? Cool. Okay, get started. I might go. Have, it's a 10 till 3. This session goes until 5 p.m. So um, you guys feel free to get up, move around, use the bathroom. Um, and then, you know, you have all of this time to work and 
uh, if you have a question, hopefully you can sort of wave your head in the air and look really confused and um, one of our helpers will come get you in a minute. Like to him, he's doing a great job. <laughs> And just, just a reminder, thank you, Kate. I think that was great. So uh, just a reminder, if you do want access to these slides, they're on the uh, they're on the tutorial website. They're on the, tut they're on the tutorial website. And uh, you can just go to the coursework from our to the 2022 co coursework, and you'll be able to just click on the link, which says uh, introductory uh, practical session day one. And you'll be able to pull up all these slides. So I know some people were still having trouble finding those slides. But yeah.